Well, I want to thank our session speakers for three really excellent presentations. Uh, Galena for framing the, the technical and policy and business issues in, in this important area. Um, and, and now we've all been trained as hackers. Please don't try that at home. Um, and uh, Keith, uh, uh, I think you may get some questions about model rocketry as well as uh, cybersecurity. Um, so as not to encroach on the coffee break, uh, I think we'll uh, um, not have time for uh, Q&A, but we'll stay up here and we'd be glad to talk with you individually. But I think we are, I see a 12 minute on this. Are we, are we being granted 12 minutes for Q&A? This is great. Thank you, Marco. Uh, so, we, we do have time for Q&A, and um, please, we have uh, microphones on the floor. I know this is a lot to take in, in these uh, three 20-minute presentations. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mignato, how, how long would it take to assemble all the information required and then actually uh, get into a system such as you described in, in your talk, which was quite scary, actually. It's complex because uh, it, um, it's depend by the different kind of attacks. But in, lot, in a lot of, uh, um, in my experience, uh, uh, a lot of attacks uh, um, uh, is um, uh, m r remain persistent for years inside the network, and uh, the organization are not able to find uh, the track, the the the, the, the low-level signal that uh, this kind of attack uh, um, arise, and um, for this reason, uh, the attacker can store information for really years. Um, it's amazing, but uh, it's the, um, the, the terrific uh, re reality. I might just add that in, in the U.S., uh, companies who have experienced this advanced persistent threat, um, more than two-thirds of them were informed by some outside entity, a law enforcement agency, that they'd been attacked. They didn't, they didn't know until somebody told them. Next question. Uh, thank you. I was wondering about the Stuxnet uh, worm uh, which you mentioned. And uh, it was very clever because uh, it really broke uh, the centrifugus by speeding up and breaking them up during the functioning. And uh, essentially it was hiding uh, the, this misbehavior by the rootkit. So uh, it come to my mind that in your research, usually you monitor the communication network, etc. Is some of your company also assessing the idea of monitoring real shop floor functioning and operation in order to spot that kind of uh, threats? Um, yes, um, they, they, they use two different malware in that operation. The first one is uh, uh, called the Beacon, and uh, it was uh, um, only uh, used to gather information about the IT infrastructure that they, they want to attack. The second one was called Bug, and uh, later was renamed in Stuxnet when uh, um, uh, Symantec uh, have analyzed it. Um, the, the second one uh, hid himself uh, using the vulnerability of the uh, Windows uh, uh, operative system uh, and uh, um, using uh, a uh, um, stolen uh, certificate, digital certificate. Um, uh, practically, the, this vulnerability um, are everywhere 
all the um, automation system uh, are based on a standard uh, operative system and they use the standard uh, uh, TCP IP um, network to communicate. Uh, so using this uh, on the shelf technology, we introduce all the vulnerability that uh, this te technology has uh, to the um, um, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, environment. Um, it is practically not possible uh, to um, defend this kind of a structure or in order to, or better, it is not, uh, not possible to prevent this kind of uh, um, uh, incident uh, because the open standards are open and so um, all uh, um, uh, the, 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 the software can uh, reach the network, can send uh, commands to this, uh, to this uh, uh, probe or um, uh, uh, equipment. Um, the, the only uh, strategy we have developed is to be able to monitor and to analyze what's happened on the network, and then to understand if uh, something uh, is changing uh, from the normal uh, um, uh, fingerprint, I can say. And so all the, the, the exceptions uh, are correlated and then we should understand if something is strange. This is the only way we have uh, developed for, to face this kind of uh, problem. Galina, do you have a comment on that? Is it better now? Can you hear me now? Okay. <laughs> um, so I can only second what was explained technically. Um, this is the nature of the industrial control systems and this is something that is applicable to any industrial control system out there. Now what we can do in terms of the monitoring, similar, similar to what Mr. Magnato explained is we need to have capability of monitoring the network and correlating those events and being able to extract information that might be relevant to that. One of the challenges of that approach on the shop floor is the fact that some of those um, uh, protocols are proprietary. And this is where the new research areas that Keith mentioned come very useful because we need to be able to do the packet inspection of those protocols in order to see what's normal traffic and what's not normal traffic. So this is one of the, uh, I would say, uh, very interesting research areas in the industrial control system space. How do we get that deep view into the networks, which is different than the enterprise space? So all of the security solution vendors are now talking about continuous monitoring um, because they know perimeter defenses, firewalls, and virus protection are insufficient. Uh, a, a data point was published last week by the the company FireEye, uh, they installed their network monitoring appliances uh, in 1,200 organizations from 63 countries across 20 different industries and just monitored for six months. And during that six months, 97% of those organizations were breached. 25% of them were breached with what could be considered an advanced persistent threat. Of those, 75% had active command and control communications from their attackers. And during the six month period could have been exfiltrating data the whole time. So this is ongoing, it's out there. Next question. Uh, Mike, uh, you are one of your staff. Now, you sort of answered that question a little bit. What I was going to ask is, do you guys visualize in the next couple of years that one of our major manufacturing facilities can be shut down for like a month or two, something like that happening? Or also, worse than that, someone gets in there and changes the data so that you're in operating, you know, General Motors or someone like that, they could say that all the problems they had, someone's come in and changed their data, you know, 
that seems to be something that's even more critical than going in and shutting you down, because at least you don't build a bad product uh, if that happens. You know you have a real problem, but suddenly if someone gets in and alters your master model or something like that, do you see things like that happening potentially in the next few years? Well, it's, uh, it's, it's really impossible to predict like what the, 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 threat, the future threats are going to be. Uh, and the reality is you shouldn't, you shouldn't spend your time worrying uh, about what the future threats are going to be. A lot of times if you just put in a well thought out security program, uh, uh, have continuous monitoring that was uh, that was uh, d discussed previously. Do things like file checking. Make sure you know. Do data integrity checking. Um, a lot of these uh, threats will be mitigated no matter what the vector is that it's coming in. So uh, a lot of people like to worry about, oh, you know, what, what's coming down the road threat-wise. Everyone's asking the government for information as to what are, what are the threats out there. Um, and, uh, and the reality is it's not really something that you should be focusing your attention on. You should be just focusing on, uh, you know, implementing good security practices uh, in your systems. Well, we are out of time, and so I'd like you to join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>